Okay, good morning. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have Simeon here. Um, Simeon has been working with the uh, HCDR team for quite some while now, doing pretty great stuff with uh, the, the CERN team, and uh, especially with Axel Laumann, whom some of you know pretty well. Yes. And it was actually our first contact, so basically he's responsible for you being here in, in one way or the other. You're equally responsible. I am probably <laughs> also, so everybody's responsible as always. Nobody's taking the blame, that's fine. <laughs> no. Um, the, the, what, I'm, what I'm really going to, to uh, be saying here is this has can, gone on for some while now, what, what Simeon is going to present today. And I think that's really something that is still underappreciated in, in many ways. I've, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people how they would like to interact with their data that they're real, really now uh, collecting large amounts of data and that they're really facing really high data rates. Um, in, in data-driven science there and, and in data analytics from the companies, a large ecosystem based on Python has been developed. And one of the central things to really do data analysis are Jupyter notebooks because they're nice, they're interactive, they're somewhat like, like MATLAB or something, but, but nicer and they work in your browser window. And of course, a lot of things have been happening around this with Pandas, with Dask, with Spark, with all these, these nice little frameworks working on, on these things. But most of this is like scheduled on a, on a, a, a basis of, of individual nodes. It's like basically batch queuing or, or uh, streaming in a sense of data. And also for large, amounts of data and high rates of data like like a twitter or at other other places where you really have a lot of online data coming in on a very short time and you might want to do analytics on them however in science these times are much shorter the rates will be much higher not the overall volume maybe the times and rates will be so short that interpreted languages like uh, Python um, reach their limits if they don't have back ends that really work very fast and, and in time. Of course, we know languages that do that and are really abundant and are really used for a very long time. And one of these is C++. It's now dominant, I would say, in HPC. It starts to, to go up again in data science a bit because people need to be fast by now. And there are little alternatives if you really want to spend a, a, a great deal of, of infrastructure that already exists. So you will always find a C or C++ compiler somewhere. Uh, but maybe even if there are better solutions than C++ around, it's usually hard to get them to work everywhere. And so one of the things that is really now the question is, do we go back to C++ in our standard workflow in writing a program that then just runs on the data? Or do we want to have something nice and interactive with Jupyter Notebooks where we can really play around and, and look at the code and get, uh, get basically interpreter-like behavior? Or do we actually want both? And Simeon's job to show us today is you don't have to choose because you can have both. And that's why he's here and that's what he's going to present you today. So I'm very happy. Thank you very much for coming. And I give over to you. Okay. Thanks, Michael, for the nice introduction. So um, it's not switching to me. Oh. Okay. I think I start with presentation and screen share. Ah, that's me again. I'm not yeah. out. <laughs> oh, the data part. <laughs> and minimize some stuff. Okay, yeah. Uh, today I want to present you uh, my work, so the extending um, the Kling 
C++ on top, top with CUDA C++ to enable CUDA C++ in Jupyter Notebook? Um, I did the talk already on the GTC in spring of this year, but the talk is so nice, so I will redo it today. It's a little bit shorter than original version because the original version I did together with Axel Hübel, and he did in general the introduction, introduction part. But I think I give you enough, you have enough background knowledge about our work and I think you will understand what we want to do. Okay, so we start in general. What we do is on the HCDR is laser plasma acceleration, uh, for example, to heal brain cancer. And the problem is we have the big uh, experiments and we want to aim a special behavior of the laser of the X-ray beams, but the problem is to get it, we have to set up the experiment uh, with different, uh, and, and we don't know how to set up exactly. So we need to do small modification and looks how it behaves. And the problem of this uh, workflow is it takes uh, some time to modify the experiment and it takes also money and so on. And so there was the idea to develop a simulation to get an idea, uh, to make it faster, to get an idea of what we can uh, change and what should be the result. And this simulation is called Picon GPU. And Picon GPU is a GPU accelerate application, and it's highly parallel and works really well and on HPC systems. So I think it's it was running on each important HPC system in the last years, which has GPUs. Yeah. But in the past, we uh, execute PMGPU. Here's a picture of the simulation with a visualized web Isaac on the Titan HPC system. It was in 2013. And there, we recognized at the first time a really important problem, which nowadays becomes bigger and bigger. So, our workflow was we simulate the application on a GPU, copy the data to a host CPU, and then we store it on this. And later we can load the data and analyze it. And we measured some uh, pub, some values. So the first was uh, we can generate a petabyte of data per second if the simulation is running at 10 hertz. I'm not sure about the right values, uh, the limpack values of Titan, but the, the value was really impressive, especially <laughs> for guys on uh, Oak Ridge which has to store the data. But then we find the first problem, so copy to the CPU. We saw, yes, from petabyte, we can simply copy one ter 100 terabytes uh, to the CPU. So we lost a factor of 10 of data, so skipping every uh, 9 of 10 results. And then there was a uh, other bottleneck, the I.O. system. <laughs> yeah, and the theory says one terabyte, yeah, and we got 270 ter uh, gigabytes. We also experiment with a little bit with compression and so on, but you see against one terabyte, against one petabyte, we lose a lot of magnitudes of data. And as more side notes, um, also storing a snapshot of the whole system takes a lot of time. In this case, it was 25 minutes to store one state to this, and that's also the time to load it from this and start the analysis. Yeah, and nowadays we see the uh, development of HPC system. The uh, Titan was at 2013, Summit was uh, started, I believe, at 2018. And we see we have much more performance, but the uh, fire IO increased slowly, and the gap between performance and IO system becomes huger and huger. And we expect it also for the new Exaflop system frontier that the gap becomes bigger and bigger. Okay, but there is a solution called the in-situ analysis. So it means we integrate the analysis in the simulation, so we avoid storing data to this. For this, for this approach, we have two different uh, possibilities. So we have a tightly coupled version with a loosely coupled version. So it means in the tightly version, we direct um, put in the simulation in source code in this, uh, the analysis in source code in the simulation 
And uh, so we have the tiny cover, or we have some system to load dynamically analysis on runtime, so via API or something else. So that means we have the dynamic code in our RAM and our static code. It means the input and algorithm is fine, and also the static code is the analysis. What we want to do is maybe we want to replace our analysis on runtime. So yes, we need a system to replace it. Okay, and so now we have the restrictions of analysis. So we have, for the classic way, with a really uh, dynamic approach, we have the limit I.O. and with, so we're storing data to this. So the solution is integrating the analysis in it. Um, today we have, we solved it with the uh, Impigon GPU with the software Isaac, which is a live visualization and is strongly coupled to Impigon GPU. So we have to know what we want to analyze it before we start the simulation. But the problem is it's not the way we want to analyze data. We want to do an explorative study. So it means we use a first analyze on the data, see something interesting, and maybe we want to do a other kind of analysis on this certain point of data and get new data. We don't want to uh, stop the whole simulation analysis system. Uh, swap the analysis and restart again and maybe calculate to the uh, simulate until the point because we have a problem to do a checkpoint. Yeah, and this, yeah, and now for a Lucy coupled system, we develop the idea to execute a Pigeon GPU in clean. And how does this work? I want to present you in uh, a notebook, but before I want to keep, give you a short uh, introduction in clean and Jupyter notebook itself. So the first part is simply about C++, interactive C++ in the web browser, or an other system. So um, in general, you can use the clean, like the Python interview. <coughs> so you can start it on a terminal, type in your code, execute it. You see here some C++ code. Yeah, this is an old fashioned way, but really practical if you want to integrate clean somewhere. You can also use integrate your, uh, the clean via a library in your application to use some uh, properties of it. Or, I already mentioned it, you can use it in the web browser. And now I, I have prepared a notebook for you, which show you uh, some advantages and uh, how it works. Before I continue with my presentation, I want to mention about it's, uh, this software which I present you now is so a big compilation of uh, the big software stack. Many people work on the software stack. You can see the big five groups which work on the Google stack. Later, when I talk about the architecture, I show you which group was responsible for which part. Okay, and now something about Jupyter Notebook itself. If you never used it before, in Jupyter Notebook, you have cells. Uh, this is a cell, this is a cell, and this is also a cell. So it means the cell has different types. That's a markdown cell for simple documentation. This is a code cell. The code cell, I write my, um, I write my uh, code and then I can execute it. And under the cell, uh, some return, uh, some, uh, some, some output will display. So I start simply classic with the hello world example and execute it. And as expected, you see hello world. Now you see the first difference about, uh, against static C++ because there's no main function. So the clean modifies a little bit the syntax of C++ because C++ was not uh, developed for interactive application. In this case, uh, you can direct type in some C++ statements in the global space because you have to solve the problem of the main. In a static application, you have one main one times so there is no need to extend it or, or have many main functions, but in Kling we need it. Um, to get a better idea of what this means, the C++ global space, I will, I will uh, explain it on a small example. Here you can see local and global variables. And at first I define a global C++ variable G1 in the global space. Now I define a local variable in this anonymous namespace and I want to access it. 
and that throws an error because after leaving the local namespace, the, um, the local variable is not valid anymore. There are also the same rules like in classic C++, you can hide a global variable with a local one. In this case, I all write with the variable three as local variable and we expect the output one, three, one because after leaving the uh, anonymous namespace, the local variable is not valid anymore. Yeah, and it works like accepted. Um, there are some rules how it works, but it feels really native and simply trying it. And yeah, if if you ever been if you ever have used Python interactive, it feels yeah, really similar. Also, defining a function and execute it works in the same way, or defining a class uh, allocator object and execute it. Yeah, in general, uh, each C plus plus the feature works also in clean, uh, which is in the standard um, C++. At the moment, clean supports C++ 17 fully. Yeah. Also, the special pro uh, property of clean Jupyter uh, notebook is you can uh, do execute the cells in a nonlinear flow. So normally, if I execute this, I would get an error because the nonlinear war was not defined. But I can do, uh, I can define it here and execute again the cell. And you see it's three. I can also execute the cell in the middle and execute the cell again. So that's the second property. You can execute cells again. What? Yeah, this is weird. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, can, I can see to the left now that there are like the numbers which I guess like indicate like what the order of the execution of the cells is, but it's weird to like jump up and then start re-executing the thing with the state. Yes, this means like every like all the code blocks you have here, they still make up the same program. They're still like there's one instance of cling running. So you don't have like one cling per cell here. Yes, it's just one cling that has all the cells. Yeah, this is correct. And it's uh now I want to explain it because it's also connected to the next point of this memory. So um, yeah, in general, there is a clean sense in the background and you have persistent memory. So it means if you define a variable one time, it's valid over all cells. And also the nonlinear work program workflow is internal, not nonlinear. It's a linear workflow, but the input is nonlinear. So you can imagine yourself, you have a, a virtual some kind of endless main function and every time you execute one cell you append the content of the cell at the end of the main function and it is executed and so you uh, now i increment again so it adds the increment statement at the end and now the c out and if you could print the history you will see it looks really real to code yeah and our I'm already uh, mentioned it, persistent memory. So it means it makes uh, depend the order of um, cells and what you do. So I iterate over the variable k, which is zero, and each time I increment the value k with one. And so you see it starts uh, from zero to four, like expected. If I execute the cell again, you see it continues with five. I can also manipulate the state in the other cell, so I subtract three. Now the value was 10, now it should start with 7. And you see it's like expected. Yeah. And then the first time it's really <laughs> good. And this behavior can be advantage or disadvantage. Yes, it is advantage. <laughs> I see a lot of potential confusion here. <laughs> yes, potential confusion. And it's really good for hacking stuff. For, for rapid prototyping, it, it's nice. For real application, it's terrible as some um, <laughs> iPhone developers. Yeah, but it can also be an advantage, for example, prototyping, or I use it in my uh, simulation analysis notebook later. So there you can see how it can use in a really clever way. Yeah, but for documentation, it's in terrible. <laughs> uh, the problem is it overrides the number of cells. So there's at the moment there is no cell at 18. So you can mention which cell was uh, executed in the meantime. Yeah, maybe there's some tool of uh, writing a, cr a chronic or something. It should be you need a notebook. Yeah, no, a notebook for the notebook. Okay. What was done? <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the uh, notebook. So 
The next thing is about templates. Templates are this range of C++. It's really good for optimization, but uh, templates are limit has a limitation. You need to specialize a template at compile time. Luckily, in uh, in the notebook, the compile time and runtime are on the same time, so you can do it in a notebook. So I wrote a short example, so a simple matrix multiplication. I prepared it. Okay, and now. We have two different kernel versions. So the first is um, the dimension of this the. This is going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> the size of the matrix is just as, as parameter. So oh. this is a classic way if you write your static application and you don't know something about the problem size. The second version is about uh, use the size of the matrix as template parameter. This, uh, that can you use if you know how big is your problem size. The second one is in general faster than the uh, first one because the uh, compiler has mer more information about uh, the problem and can optimize it. So now I want to execute both uh, kernels. Here you can see I specialize it and it works, no error. And I can also measure the time. And you see the template version is faster than the variable version. Yeah, it's not a real benchmark, but I execute this cell so often, and every time it was the same result. And it makes sense because the compiler knows that the dimension was 10 or something else, and he can add some vectorization and, and so on. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, have you taken into account the compile time needed for this, or the interpretation time? Uh, no. Yeah, I should do it. Yeah, and that's a really good point, which which I had forget. Often I say something about, yeah, that's a really important. PGA guys ask. Oh no, <laughs> later I will talk about it if I add optimization. At the moment we use the optimization level is zero, so there's no optimization. Okay. Yeah, but I believe the template version takes a little bit more time because temp every song in templates in general takes more time in the compiler. But yeah, I think the, the example is too simple to get real a uh, good, points. Maybe we have some some kinds of big simulation with different kernels, you will see some difference. Yeah, but later if I play a little bit on optimizations, I explain something about this. But so no, I have a question, yeah. uh, like a few cells before you created a memory leak. If you execute that cell 10 times, will it, will it crash at some point? Will the system run out of memory? Um, like where you allocated the input arrays, like A, B and C? Yeah, the top. running out of memory is possible. If you scroll up, yeah, so to where you allocate those, like like this uh, cell, like twenty three. If you if you just hit enter and enter and enter, 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 at some point, like it, it needs to blow up, does it? Uh, does it never free at the moment? That will not happen because it's really simple. Redefinition is not allowed. In uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but if you remove the okay. the, the, the re declaration. <laughs> And if you just, or if you just wrote new float dim times dim and then execute yeah. that line, like it, it, it needs to fill up in the background, I yeah. guess. You can crash the application to allocate too many uh, memory, like a, like a normal problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yes. And also a problem of the interpreter is, okay, it's also a problem of static C++, but um, here it's uh, more important. You can also allocate some dead memory because now if I allocate new, uh, I would remove everything and uh, allocate the memory from A and B. There's new memory on A and B, but the other uh, memory is still existent, but you can't access it anymore because mm -hmm. there's no reference in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a disadvantage of the interactive way. And yes, uh, in the normal, if you work with it, you have to learn some short, uh, some small tricks to use it interactive, for example. Uh, a big friend is anonymous namespaces mm -hmm. because uh, then you have not a problem of redefinition. And you have, yeah, and memory management is also a problem because you have no garbage collector, so uh, you have to uh, be careful with this kind. And in this case, it makes sense to use objects with a structure which clean up automatically the space. Yeah, the, the usual rules apply. Yes. In C, you would also not write that. You would use like, yeah. a vector, a unique pointer, whatever, like something that manages its memory underneath. Yeah. On the other side, it's also uh, a question 
and also how do you want to use the interpreter. In general, you don't want to write your big uh, business code in the notebook itself. Mm. This is the next point. You want to include and link some files and you want to add some custom code, small custom code, or put the whole components together and simply control it with the notebook. Mm -hmm. Or other kind, uh, other idea is to use it for rapid prototyping, but you don't want to write uh, some application like Pico GPU in the notebook itself and execute it every time because it's uncomfortable to use it. <laughs> I yeah. can see that. Yeah, we, I have a different question. Um, if you would uh, then like in, in this interpreter mode, create a, a variable that's not trivially destructible. Like, like something that has a destructor that does something. When will this destructor be run? Um, it's the same rules like static C++. If you, yeah, but when does main end in the interpreter? Uh, if you close the notebook or okay. shut down the kernel. So if I, if I create a file here, like, like, like std, std f stream, I, I yeah. open a file stream and then just leave the variable there. The file will be held open until I close the notebook. Yes, so here, wait a moment. Here, here you can see the running, uh, the running ah, okay. process. Okay, the file is shut down. It's shut down. So, okay, uh, okay. something about the tunnel stuff. So, the cling itself has a main function, mm -hmm. and the cling has, uh, has two, um, two tasks. The one is uh, translating, in, uh, translating the code. To, uh, just in time compile the code which is input and the other task is providing the runtime itself mm -hmm. and later if i talk about reflection we will see uh, what is the advantage to the uh, memory space between the clean and the interpreter and the runtime is shared mm -hmm. so every so if i allocate uh, some memory here it's in the same memory space like the cling is allocating for his ast so in the background, there is a main function, the main function of the cling. And if this is ended, it cleans up the whole process. Mm -hmm. yeah, in this case, it's the kernel. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, we have chunk count. This example is one thing that we compiled. We have to the cell. Uh, but in this case, it will not be compiled. But it, it has to be generated later when you call it. Right? It's compiled both times. And it's. Um, because it's templated, like uh, yeah. Um, in this case, we have some caching effects. So if I define this, uh, it's defined internally the um, generic version of the template. So we have, um, in general, what a compiler is doing if it has a template. It take the not specialized version and compile what it can. So, for example, you have a class and one function used the template and one function didn't use the template. It at first, it will compile the, uh, the function without the template because it can it. And later, if you specialize it, it use this state and specialize it. It's also an advantage because uh, in general, you say, now you can save time because uh, this takes a little bit time and this takes a little bit time. And if I use the other dimension, it needs just the time which this uh, execution also needed. Uh, if you have it in a static compiler and you uh, split it on different translation units, you have the problem that the compiler translates the generic version again and again and again, and you can't save it in an intermediate file, like an object file or something. And this is a big problem how, uh, why compilers take so long time if it's compiling templates, because it has to do every time. Yeah. And later I want to present uh, Alpaca, it's a, it's a framework to um, to um, abstract parallelization on different tools, and there is also the idea for testing because you can save time. Of course. Okay. Okay. I have to look. Yeah, we was and in, including and linking. Yeah, and I already talked about. So in the clean, it's also uh, possible to include and link include header files and link shared libraries. In this case, I will uh, I define my header files and TPP files just in time. So I use a so-called magic command. 
Yeah, you can see the file. <laughs> yeah, it's the real name. The magic command. <laughs> the best thing is it calls the function magic. And the file is also called magic, is it? Yeah, and yes. And there are uh, some magic commands. This magic command simply means uh, store the following content to the file through HPP. The other magic command is also uh, measure the time execution time of a cell. So I define the header file and the CPP file. And now I use the other magic command, which means run the bash command and use the GCC to compile a shared library. And you see, I defined the function bar in the namespace who. And yes, so without including, if I want to access the function, I get error because it's not defined. So now I include it, the function is defined. Now you get a link error. Yes, and I get a link error because I have no implementation. Now I use a pragma to uh, link it, and now it works. Yeah, and the best thing about the mechanism is. This is static C++ code. So in general, you can link every C++ uh, library without modification. So the special um, special modification and the sem semantic are no valid, uh, just valid for uh, the interactive input. So internally, clean transform it a little bit and work with valid C++ code. So there is no incompatibility to existing libraries. For example, I could also include the lib SSL now. Yeah, just a small problem are the interfaces because you need interfaces which are this maybe designed for interactive usage, but there's also a problem. A question between uh, the, the, the cell 32, where you invoke GCC. Yeah. Um, this is run inside Kling. Uh, no, but oh, this is a different call cell here. Yes. It's ah, okay. Um, it's also possible that uh, I saw it not in practice before, but it's possible that you include other uh, you other interpreters for each cell, mm -hmm. so you can mix it in a notebook. This is more like a special function, so because the process was started, uh, no, yeah, it's simply an exact command. And it uses the uh, root of the notebook. Okay, but this is not run by the Kling instance. No, no, this is this is a feature of the kernel. Okay, yeah, okay. And it has to su uh, support it. So in general, magic commands are supported by the kernel. So not every magic command works with every language. And uh, this magic command up there is also not a Kling feature. No. So ah, I thought that like it's in, in like in the Kling C world you can actually write no, that. No, that's a ah. kernel feature. So if you want to type this in the terminal application, it will not work. Okay, so this is because we are now in a Jupyter kernel. Yes, that's okay. And feature. the remainder is now C plus. Is this yeah. now actually running Kling? No. This is running clean in the background. So uh, later I'll talk about the architecture and then you will understand how it works. But in general, a uh, Jupyter Notebook is a front end and you add kernels with an interpreter inside itself and you uh, speak against the API. So you have a general API mm -hmm. and you put in your input in the kernel and the kernel is something doing with this and then it gets back some output. This is the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine it's like um, if you start the King into the other Python interval, you can put in standard in and on the other side standard out. Mm -hmm. It's also possible. And this is the same way. I'm still kind of confused. <laughs> yeah, later. Okay, okay. okay. I talk about, about, we'll about the architecture and then you will maybe understand something. Okay. Um, yeah, this was the classic C++ stuff. And now we can talk about, uh, talk about special um, clean features and features enabled by Jupyter Notebook. So the first one is we can make it much easier to write the Hello World example. Yeah, this is the rebel object representation and it's triggered by the missing semicolon at the end. So it's not an er error anymore. Oh my God. <laughs> so you leave over the semicolon and now it starts what? 
Yeah. Yeah, so but imagine I have a function call yes. that spawns multiple lines, yes. and one of the arguments is the literal header uh, as yeah. it's written here. It's a restriction. You can just miss it on the last line. How is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> last semicolon can just miss. I'm not so freaking out. Yeah. If you do it in the middle of the code, word. you get the classic <laughs> exception. Yeah, and you can also use the. Uh, uh, the workage is you miss the semicolon at the end of the last line of the function. Um, I can add also, so it means, um, no, not I, because I used I so oft, ASD. And you can do um, this. Okay, and it doesn't work. What? I don't know why. Um, theoretically, it should work that it, that four should be branded. I believe it's a bug. Um, was it yeah, yeah. Is this just like the inline um, uh, statement in Python notebooks, where you can, uh, when you write uh, or determine that it's inline, mm -hmm. then everything that's supposed to be printed, you can leave out the print. Mm. And uh, just add the variable name, and then it's printed out. Uh, I'm not sure because I don't know the mechanism. But what Kling is doing, it recognizes. So before it's compiling, let's check the code and look at the really last statement. Look if the semicolon is missing, and if it's missing, internally it adds the semicolon, but it makes a mark. And then it's take the return value of the really last value mm -hmm. and print it. Um, if you want to get some output in the middle of your code, you have to use uh, normal commands like standard C out. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's not possible to do it inside your code. So then you get simply an error. And also, what is missing here, what is supposed by the terminal application and the other kernel is. Normally, it would sh also show the type of the uh, of the variable. I believe the presentation you can see it. No, sorry, uh, but I have a terminal open, so I can do it. When you write, uh, one moment, I maximize it. You get the type also. Yeah, I open an issue that should be also supported by the kernel, but it's not working at the moment. And it's really nice if you use, for example, the keyboard auto, because then you get the correct type. Yeah, and this is part of the next uh, slide, the reflection feature, because it works hand in hand with the rebel object representation, because Kling has information about the variable. Here it knows it's a char array, so it has to print a string. Here it knows it's the integer, so it has to print a number. Also the return value of this function. I have another question. Yeah. How does it know how to format this value on the terminal? The terminal, it's implementation by the... Um, oh, and the terminal. This is... Because now it prints the string representation of the number. Yeah. So there's various way of turning an int into a string. Yeah. And what would happen then if I would define my own type? How would it know how to format it? Simply C, struct S, when you get an address. Well, nice, but now I want to have a string representation. Do I need to like overload the put operator? Do I need to provide an overload for two string? Is it using still format? No, uh, I believe it doesn't use uh, the I'm not fully sure, but I don't believe it used the user implementation for printing. It used uh, the rapid, the representation module is uh, implementation of Kling. And the basic types are simply supported by the Kling. So it means if an unknown type, it will print the memory address and you can't override it. So I have no way of providing a way that it could print S here. Uh, I believe. But I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I saw no option, but uh, Kling has a small issue with documentation. 
Uh, yeah, okay. Also, user of documentation, I found a lot of nice features. Also, Clean Now supports C modules, but I know it because I saw the comments. Yeah, and this is a big problem of Clean in general. We have just a few manpower, but uh, and the manpower is centered to, to developing new features, but documentation is a, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. but there is no way that you know. Um, what you can do is I copy it here, and now you get the type of the uh, function. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I want to see that A and B have the yeah. Value. Then you have to implement the function in in the struct and execute the function. That prints that then. Yeah, that prints. That's okay. not. Uh, it's not like standard C out. Mm -hmm. so. So I have now, if I now have like a vector of, of ints, it, it could not print it like as a list uh, it's, or a hash table. It's implemented, so uh, include. Like if you have a type for an include. Hmm? Oh. Wrote in, in old, yeah, classic include. Standard. You now do a vector of integers. Integers, whatever, and that's like. And does it work? Two, yes, three, four, five, one, two, three, so. Yeah. Like okay. it works because it's C. Yes. And now you print A. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So how does it know how to format that? It's really simple, it's overloaded. So Kling knows what is a vector and can access Because it's hard coded yes. inside Kling. It's hard coded. So if I would now use boost vector. For example, I believe then it would not work. Okay, then it gives me the, the address again. Yeah, but there is no way I can hook in this mechanism. I would not say there's no way, but, but I don't know it. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe it's a, because um, I show in in a short moment I show you how you can access the cling itself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here. Thank it's, you. Yeah, that's the next part because it's the um, reflection part. So you can include a interpreter itself it's in your memory space. Because, uh, no, it's wrong. The interpreter lives in your memory space. It's cheating. You need just the header file to know how the um, file looks. And now you can access some uh, functionality of the interpreter. For example, you can ask of the optimization level. At the moment, it's three. And you can set it with the function up to level three, and now it's three. So now if you would go back to the matrix multiplication benchmark you had before, like the numbers would be different now. Um, in this case, we have a small problem. I had to, um, I need other dimension because the problem is Kling is lazy. It already compiled the matrix multiplication with the dimension of 10. So it will reuse unoptimized. Ah, it doesn't recompile now that you yeah. change the compilation. It didn't mm -hmm. dimensionally recompile. Yeah. So if I would add the other dimension, for example, um, right. 12. But in ABC, maybe. Hmm? Oh, that we, that we, that we, that we ABC, I'm um, not sure. Because A is only 10. So. Wait a moment. No, it can do because it writes it take A and B as input and write it to C and O right. So the result would be the same. It's not a problem to ABC. Okay. Really important is that I change the errors are too small now, is it? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I understand. Uh, sorry, yeah, then I maybe I use eight. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, sorry for yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And now this version is uh, more optimized than this version because now we use the template. We have new specialization of the function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if I would uh, use again, I believe it was. Can you go oh, to 512? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you put this to, to 102024? DIM. I believe. But do you need to hard type it here or if you just redefine DIM? Um, Will that work? Um, you have you have, to be, uh, you have to use a const expression. I know, no, but if you, if you go up now to where you define dim, and you, you like this cell, now you change it to one thousand twenty-four. Uh, it's not possible because it's a const expression. I can't change the value. It's const. 
I have to define a second value and use it. Okay. Yeah, because that makes sense. So, so yeah. if I if I declare a variable const expr like for the whole time of the interpreter, the value cannot be changed anymore. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's also a really important background uh -huh. information. This is C++ and not Python, so it means we have the same C++ rules. So it means if a value is const, it's const. You can't change it. Yeah. Um, sometimes it helps a lot of to remember that uh, we have internal <laughs> valid C++. So uh, what is Kling doing? It takes this crazy syntax and do some source code transformation that we have um, valid C++ and then it put it in the Clang LVM compiler instance. And so you have the same rules. That's just the exception that the uh, compiler is not stopping. So you can simply add code. You can, it's like start your compile process, adding the file, stop the compiler at the moment, adding your file and continue or something else. Living in a debugger or something. Hmm? You start a debugger session and then you can execute code. Today. Yes. Yeah, debugging is also a nice feature, for example. Yeah, that would be a good question. Like, can you debug now? Uh, let's yes. say I want to put a breakpoint in the, in the matrix multiplication. <laughs> would that work? No? But it's planned. Okay. Yeah, okay. there is an official uh, debugger interface with Jupyter Notebook. And this week, I read the news that the SUSE Clean Corner, which I use for this notebook, is now official part of the uh, Jupyter. Uh, association, so it's officially supported. And some weeks before, say, uh, they specified an API for a debugger. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can. Oh, wait a moment. If I, maybe I see it in the web. Oh, I'm in the web browser. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that would have been my next question. Like, what is what, what kind of program are you actually running here? So, this is a web browser. Uh, Kling, uh, Firefox, is it? Yeah, Firefox. Yeah, I wanted because he had it full screen, and I wondered, like, like, is this some kind of desktop app or, or what, no, what is he? Um, using? But that's the Jupyter notebook. Okay, okay. Oh no, no, no! It's Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the problem is I have a presentation profile in my Firefox, so there's no message blowing up, and so on. And you see, don't see my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> my free time, I develop for train. Oh, sorry, I never <laughs> said it. <laughs> no, no. I can't. Wait, it's recorded. That, that's okay. <laughs> we have like okay. a more. Yeah, I, I know Yuji is on the call. He's developing Fortran as well. You, you can can be become friends with him. <laughs> <laughs> In secret, the debugger project. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah let's take some seconds. Since when do they support videos on GitHub? This is a GIF. So people still use GIF like a technology that's 30 years old and should just die. Yeah, I have <laughs> like Fortran. <laughs> like Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> also, a stream recording outputs. Um, Why is stopping? Because it's GIF. <laughs> <laughs> I have a screen recorder which output format is a GIF and it's really nice for GitHub. Uh, yeah, and now you can add the breakpoint, add the debugger, and set the breakpoint. Yeah. Yeah, next thing to discover, actually, we wrote an IDE. <laughs> yeah. And this is also planned. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, not, it's not planned. Technically, I used it because <laughs> um, Google Notebook is a client server application and the uh, uh, API is defined. And so I use the extension and my Emacs to use Jupyter Notebooks. Of course you do. Yeah, yeah because. because I don't like the web browser. It's not, a, it's not an editor, and you have a lot of missing features. So it, I simply ju use Jupyter Notebook in my web browser and my Emacs, and then I can search around and files and copy and replace, and it's great. And it makes it easy to access remote resources, mm -hmm. like from an HPC system. Okay. Yeah, we have already uh, a Jupyter service at the address, and you can allocate a notebook, get your resources, and then you can start in a notebook. You don't need any knowledge about SSH and port forwarding and so on. That's just really nice. You can use it on Himera too, from her HCP. Yeah, and I never worked there yet. Yeah, but that is really complicated. Okay. Mm, 
it's okay as long as you're on the HZBR network. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a problem sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but I've written a tutorial on yeah. that. But in general, it's... <laughs> but you can also include Jupyter notebooks in your VS Code or Atom editor. Yeah. There are packages. I also available. don't use those. But, um, <laughs> the, um, I never use any Jupyter notebooks, but in principle, it looks cool. Like it gives you like this interactive playground, like together with like the documentation around. I could see this could be very useful for teaching, for example. Yes, yes. Yeah, and we already use it for teaching. We, um, it was just a hack, but we had a lesson about GPU uh, development. Mm -hmm. And I use a small hack that you can redefine kernels. And mm -hmm. in the second notebook, just a short preview, you have uh, the notebook itself generates pictures. Mm -hmm. of a kernel and for the game of life that was also the um, the exercise they have to implement the kernel and then they can execute the cell and see if was the result correct and if not they change the kernel execute the kernel again and run the cell again so they have constantly uh, developed on one cell and execute both and see the result immediately without any knowledge about terminals or so on simply focused on the kernel itself. And the idea was to teaching how do you use indexing in CUDA applications. You also don't need loops now. You can keep executing the same thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, in this case, we use a loop because then you will see it. There are some, there are some nice figures which uh, provide the animation and yeah. If you're correct as recite, you see immediately that is correct. Okay. So since there was no debugging function in, in Jupyter notebooks up until now, um, print debugging is also very nice with Jupyter notebooks because you can go back, re-execute cells, change stuff, and just yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't scale. I you know. The program goes to a million lines, like. It's not going to work. So. <laughs> yeah, this is only for, for I know it's like for little scripts. Yes. So that makes sense. Statements without that final semicolon. You can put in between some code. Uh, like no. declare a function. No, it's you only can, the last line. Yeah, only the last line. Okay. And the reason is because the mechanism is really stupid. It simply looks at the last line. Okay. And if it's missing, add it and then send it to compiler. And if it's some uh, it, if is it in between some uh, missing. Yeah. The crash. The reason is really simple because uh, C++ don't know line breaks, so it has no other option to recognize when the statement is ending. Yeah, and this is a special case because you know you hit the end and that's a complete statement. This is the end, but this is the extra uh, information. So I just want to reiterate on, on this um, because I, I now also know that there is no semicolon at the end of the function call. So Clang will just add on the last line of input the semicolon if it's not there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it will REPL print it, the result. Yeah, there is no semicolon. Because uh, internally it said a flag that it should print the last statement and then it do it. So if I would write full colon colon bar parentheses semicolon, it would not print 32. Yes. Because then I just call call the function. Yes. And the return value is discarded. Yes. But if I leave the semicolon, then Kling knows I need to REPL print that and then it will do. Okay, good. Correct. Yes. And it's also nice. Uh, I use it often in the terminal because I'm an old guy. <laughs> but uh, it's also interesting if you have to uh, uh, to be sure about some memory options, for example, the shift of our, uh, not the, the Double assemble um, the end symbol or the ampersand. Ampersand, yes, thanks. If you have the double ampersand symbol in moving memory, for this it's also interesting if you want to check your code if it's due the right way because you can check the memory X uh, addresses each time. So, uh, for example, if I defined. Uh, uh, Okay, this is a new int. What? You already have an A oh. and it's a vector. Okay, I need more. 
Okay, you see, uh, AI is running on this, and now I can do uh, uh, this. And I see it shows on the same memory, so I know it's the same. This time it's not visual, but sometimes you have to do something with uh, move semantic. Mm -hmm. Or you can also use it um, if you work with constructors and destructors and so on. It's really helpful to recognize where is your memory actually lying, laying in the memory space. What happens if you would provoke uh, undefined behavior? Like let's say you delete BS, yeah, and then you access AS. Uh, hopefully not. So now the mem, the integer behind it is gone, but it's still the address is still written there, but the the storage behind it is deleted. Why is it? So you now div. That's okay still. Okay, because it's valid on BS. So if you now dereference AS and assign an integer, like asterisk AS equals whatever. Okay, it should be null, right? If you delete. No, it's not null. Delete doesn't set to null. Mm -hmm. No. We will see. What are you doing now? Then, if you do free, it sets to null? No, it doesn't. Just freeze the memory so it's reusable. It's I don't think it actually deletes the value that's stored there. So it should it just say because it doesn't crash. And that's what we check when Because we you didn't do any invalid access yet. Yeah, I mean, AS correct or not. And sure that the memory behind AS is just invalid. The variable AS is accessed in the moment. Yes, you all that have. But you see. Okay. Oh, but can you now write and not, not be referenced? Yeah, asterisk AS. And don't, don't declare an int. Just do asterisks AS. So you cannot do any extension. And, uh, and then like equals something. 30, 32. So now you like do a write. To, yeah, you know, to memory. It. Okay. <laughs> so it should crash. Like, like this is undefined behavior. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's undefined behavior. It doesn't say it should crash. Okay. Yeah. Something. Uh, what crash? So Kling now does not detect that, that this is a programming error. This is the uh, error. should crash. Uh, yeah. Should crash. But I'm not sure. Oh no! Oh. <laughs> yeah, this is the stupidest key ever. I hate it. And okay. And oh, oh, come on! <laughs> and. Uh, Nope. Has to call in. Okay, because you can stat because the static analyzer can now see that you're trying to access yeah. an null pointer. In general, this is the approach of clean. Uh, is uh, this is a really big problem in general? So, if you write, if if you want to crash your uh, your user code, the clean completely crash because it's the same memory space. And yes, there are some static analyzers inside the clean to avoid this. The problem is there is no general approach, so it means if you have luck, uh, it uh, it catches the error before it's executed. If not, it crashes. Okay. What happens if you throw an exception here? Does clean crash? Yeah, throw forty two. Okay. Recovering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never used it. Yeah. Yeah, this is. Maybe you should start the other presentation. <laughs> more, more details for the. Okay. <laughs> the question. Now, now I want to try something else. Can you can you type a a s, yeah. and then the the subscript, like the the opening uh, bracket, and then like a large number. Large. Really large. <laughs> it, should, it should still be a size t. <laughs> Come on. Something like that. Yeah, and then you equal equal zero or whatever. So now like AS is that points to dead memory. Now I'm writing to a ridiculous address on dead memory. Like this is a crash. That should be a crash. <laughs> okay, so okay. can you can you make it smaller? <laughs> it should compile. Ah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so cling cling will crash on some kinds of undefined yes. behavior, but if it by accident works out. It by accident, yeah. everything is running. 
Yeah, it's, it's also a problem because uh, it's not like Python. Python is designed to never crash. Mm -hmm. Do simply stupid things, it's okay. So just because it ran in Kling, it doesn't mean it's bug free. It can still yeah. have bugs, the same as a normal C++ program. Yeah. And it can be undetected. Yeah, and this is, I think that's also a problem which you should solve because... Oh, you can solve it. Yeah. Maybe you have to work with a snapshot system or something. I believe there is a snapshot system, but it doesn't work at the moment. But okay. yeah, this is what you want. You want to snapshot because if your application crashes, it's fine, but you want to continue. But now you lost all the data. Yes. If, if, if that would happen in your Jupyter notebook now. The data is lost. Then like, like all the 30 cells you executed previously, like all that state is gone. Yeah. And wait a moment. I believe okay. in Jupyter. But that's Jupyter. Really for Jupyter notebooks. You only have temporary memory, except you store it on some on your server, for example, okay. on Himera. Mm -hmm. I think there is option for auto save for the code. Yeah, I believe that's also a run. Please, mm -hmm. nice. Run all above selected cells. This solves your problem. Yes. <laughs> and so if I provoke a crash here, I would need to rerun everything. Yes. But, yes. but it gives me the option to just execute everything as I wrote. Yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. And the advantage is, in this case, you have to write clear code. <laughs> no hacks with redoing and changing a little bit. So. <laughs> it's a nice feature <laughs> because it, uh, it's good for clear notebooks. <laughs> And at focus, we uh, we producible notebooks. Mm -hmm. Will Kling restart from its own? Okay. Yes. If a crash, okay. Yeah, you yeah, will see it here and in the log. Yeah, and unfortunately, a crash often. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit, especially if you want to, uh, if you prototype. <laughs> Does it give you compiler warnings? Uh, yes. Let's say I I don't know I I have a I declare a float like float f equal pass to Kelly. Okay, yeah, that, that is clean. But also the Jupyter notebook. Um, I'm not sure if the if it passed in the in the terminal. We have to see here. I'm not sure what's okay. okay. the implementation of Susting. Maybe it prints in the terminal or in the notebook. Okay, okay. Yeah, but I'm not sure. Oh no. But you can test it and open an issue. Uh, I'll already did it finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue please. <laughs> we talk about open now we take an hour for a presentation which normally takes 30 minutes and we are not at the half. <laughs> Welcome to Carlos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you have a system memory and reflections. Oh, and Okay, and back to the us uh, the question of Jan. Yeah, there's a special property because we have runtime and compile time together. And if you increase the optimization, it can happen that the execution time of a cell increases because the execution time of a cell is the compiling time plus runtime. So it means if you have really cra crazy optimization, it increases the optimal compile time. And sometimes the win of the exit uh, runtime is not enough to uh, reduce in some all. So it could be a disadvantage. Yeah, and I already mentioned it. Uh, Clean is lazy, so it has some internal sales which also reduce compiler. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now this is a great. That's a crazy feature. It's not great. Like this is this is a good definition. box. And now you can really bad things. For example, fixing this officially wrong function because everybody knows what this week is wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it works. Nice. Okay, now define func again and it overrides the previous definition. Uh, no, it's <laughs> likely not. So I could define the std vector now myself with a completely different thing. And that would work. I could redefine the standard library now. Uh, yes. I could redefine f open and c out. Yeah. <laughs> Should it work? And I can explain you now because I was uh, the implementation was the idea was provided by the uh, chef C plus plus architect of Google, which I meet in wow. the EU, Yeah, uh, Karim Chandler. Uh -huh. And the idea is that Chandler proposed that. Yes. 
Yeah, and it use uh, hiding namespaces, which are not displayed here. But if you enable the redefinition feature, it creates every time a new namespace and hide the original definition. So if you know the numbering, uh, the numbering template and the name, you can access the old definition with via namespace. So I believe some. Uh, I'm not correct, but theoretically something like this should work and then you can I know this. so like you redefine the function you basically define another version in a different namespace but that namespace shadows the old one yes but we don't know the namespace here like it's, it doesn't tell us what namespace it is yeah yeah the namespace handling is done internally yeah yeah that kind of makes sense because that means functions that are previously JIT compiled and referred to the old entities still refer to the old entities yeah yeah and uh, the feature is brand new, and I have just a less um, less experience with it. I'm not sure if you have some practice problems if you access memory. Because this means if I now define another function, func2, and it calls func. Yeah. And I call func2, and it gives me 43. And I now fix func. Yeah. And, and now I execute func2. The func2, since it was compiled before I fixed, would still refer to the old version. Yeah, I believe this was a problem which I also find out. So maybe, maybe a moment, we can do it. Oh, don't worry, like, it's taking too much time. But isn't this logic? If you don't run this, rerun the cell, even though you... you no, it's not logic. <laughs> yeah, this is the next problem. Then, yeah, because for, for me, coming, what's logic for people? Coming from a normal Python, Notebooks, this is the way these notebooks behave. So, so now you run func2. Func yeah. And now you run func2 again, it still gives you 42. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not consistent with what I see here. Uh, yeah, it's consistent with the state in the background. Yes. Yeah, this is the problem. So, uh, not the problem yet, but yeah, this is. You have. <sighs> what do you. Is a question how you want to use yeah. the uh, thing. So mm -hmm. I know it from uh, Python. The, some behaviors is just magic. I don't know how it works. It works at the first moment like expected. But the problem is if it not works like expected, I have no idea how it works. And this is I can see a lot of potential confusion here. <laughs> and this is this is a disadvantage and the advantage of C++. Mm -hmm. It works. Maybe it not works like expect every time, but you have a clear idea how it works. And if you know this is this infinite main loop with the state in the background and putting code on it, you can work really well on it. And maybe in the future I will I start a small guide for some hacks for Kling, how you can use this knowledge to mm -hmm. do uh, crazy things like the anonymous namespace. So how avoid redefinition in the classic way is this uh, three and four and uh, standard C out. Wait a moment. Now we can do rapid prototyping. And this is the implementation of the body. And what you can also do is how to define input arguments. Um, input argument. And this is how I prototype function C function in Jupyter Notebook without the redefinition feature. And then if the function is ready, I copy it to the real version of the function. So if I define where to seven now, and I execute the block underneath, will it change or will it not? Um, it change. Okay, but put the int back. So you not change the value, you redefine it. It's um, a different thing, is it? At the moment, yes. Now it can be a little bit weird. Okay, so now change it to like 77 or something, like make it bigger. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so here it transitively refers to the variable, but if it's a function, it does not. 
Uh, no, the problem is because I execute the cell again. Here, I don't execute the function definition again. So you have, um, you have to mention, if the cell is executed, it used the current state. And internally, it looks what was the last, uh, last implementation of VER. Mm -hmm. And here, it... Uh, because if I execute the definition again, it will not redefine because it's not to execute, it's just compilation. And uh, the problem is if you execute this cell, it executes the code again, and at this point it looks where is VER defined. And this, and it's then it compiles. So here it stores a reference to func, which was in this moment implementation which returns 42. And if I execute the cell, it has the compile code already. And here it compiles every time because. <laughs> Exactly, why? This is yeah, the same basic block as it's a basic block up there. Uh, I believe it has something to do how the compiler caches. Yeah. Because it was anonymous and it's hot. Don't, don't worry, I'm just, I'm just find this funny. Like, I, like, I, I can see like if you play long enough, you will get more confused. Yeah. <laughs> I, believe, I believe the reason is because here we have a reference and here not. Here we have the reference to function name fun2. And uh -huh. here we have no reference, so. I, I think this is the trigger of when a function is stored, mm -hmm. the compiled version is stored or not. Because this block doesn't have a name. Yeah. Like it cannot be compiled and put somewhere. Exactly. That's not, it's not the same like this. Because that's a linear name, this internal, it has a number. If you execute the code, same. It's not the same code like before. Mm -hmm. It's like a, creating a lambda, lambda, lambda function also internally number it. If you execute the same lambda on two different positions on your code, it's two different lambdas. Mm -hmm. It has the same functionality, but the compiler don't know it, and it will compile it both times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, this, and this should be the reason why this is also executed. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and I also tested refraction with classes. And I'm not sure what are the boundaries of the implementation, but yeah, it's nice for playing. Yeah, yeah and it's also a general problem because um, so Kling was originally developed for the root framework, and at some they use it to store data. The problem is they have a large Hadron Collider and they produce petabytes of petabytes of data. And they have a problem to store it fast. And one idea is store it in the C representation and load it so there are no conversion steps in time. And for this, they need the reflection to get the data type because they don't want to implement each time the data type or not. The problem is um, you change your data type, you add some data from some sources and so on. So the um, data type is not fixed before. But the problem is, if it's not fixed, it's not performant. But with the JIT compiler, you can you get knowledge about your data struct, and then you can uh, optimize it again. Uh, explain it a little bit other. So the problem is, if you allocate a dynamic data type, like a point, so the classic dynamic data type in C++ is a pointer, and allocates some memory. The problem is, the compiler don't know what to do at runtime. And with the JIT compiler in the background, the compiler now knows what are you doing. For this, for the JIT compiler, it's static code. And now it can comp optimize the whole code for this. And this is used by the root framework to enable a really fast I.O. system. So they spend just a, a few time to store the uh, convert data. No, they don't convert the data. They can use the data like it is in the memory. It's just a binary prop. You can load it directly in your mem memory, have the information about the C++ representation, and you can directly work on it. And this was the origin of the Kling interpreter. They also use for some other functionalities. Uh, this was not the origin of the Kling. It was the origin of the precision synth, which was an old, uh, old implementation which originally understand just C, then it was extended to C++, and then I believe Axel Norman says, oh, I don't want to spend much time to re-implement the C++ on a nano was the idea. He used Clang LVM library and put our interpreter interface on the top, and they saw, oh, the 
Interpre interpreter can do more things than we want. And then they outsource to an extra project, and now the people can use it for different things. And I think one problem of this approach is that uh, nobody writes his experience down. There's the Zeus Clean community, they have some small example notebooks to get an idea, but I never see some best practice because it's active C++ is not the same like static C++. But I think if the project becomes bigger and bigger, I will generate some guides like this. And, this, and the restriction of C++ is also necessary to keep the performance, otherwise we can use Python. Because Python has a lot of logic in the background which handles the problems, but the logic needs a lot of performance. And so we need to restrict ourselves a little bit to keep the performance. Okay. Oh, the last point of the notebook. <laughs> now some uh, notebook magic. Um, yes, like the first question. Yeah, include XTL. Where is this coming from? Yeah. Uh, this is. This are the some hyper libraries of the guys from Zeus Clean. The, the kernel which I use here for the notebook is the Zeus Clean kernel, and the guys from Quantstack provide also some hyper libraries. And now I okay, so this is part of like the Jupyter environment. There are some there are some pre-installed libraries. That um, XTL yes, XTL is included. Zeus also, but there is also an ex, uh, extra library called XWinchets. Mm -hmm. And X widget is really crazy. So I start easily. I define a C function which simply loads um, a file from, from the disk um, stored in a buffer and then uh, send it to the interpreter instance and say, hey, this is a picture, print it in the web browser. And now I can print it. And this is the really easy way. The XWidget library, uh, which I didn't include it here, but they enable a lot of more features, for example, buttons, sliders, audio output, controller input, movies. So, yeah, you can control. I mean, why a movie not? Via Xbox controller with C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this also idea, and I saw it already to design easy interfaces because. There are also some HTML helper structs which are mirrored to uh, some C++ function and you can uh, describe in C++ how your GUI should look. And then there is an extra project which removes the cells which describe it and you have your um, GUI in a, in a Jupyter Notebook and somebody, so you develop your application in it, uh, put it in the generator and then you can deliver the GUI to a physicist and he can use your tool. Can you scroll up again, please? Yes. Totally. I just want to see that again. So that the, you read a file, you clear yes. the interpreter out file, and then what? You paste 24 decode? Yeah, I decode because this is what was? So this file is like a PNG. Okay. Yeah. And then I have to define what? And this is a ah, so object so from you take, the kernel. So you take the PNG file, which is like a plain normal PNG binary, yeah. you base 64 encode that and put it in the HTML yeah. somewhere. Yes. Okay. And then simply say, okay. Okay. you can also uh, change the type to plain HTML or something else. So what you did now was just you pump the PNG, the, the PNG file into the Jupyter notebook uh, as, as an HTML element somehow. Um, one time to avoid the complicate uh, to avoid to include a library which generates PNGs, I wrote a small generator mm -hmm. which generates a HTML table to display this kind. Mm -hmm. This was also nice because it's really easy. Simply uh, HTML. A little bit CSS code, but was complicated. <laughs> and then, uh, depending on the state of the cell, saying dead or alive, so white or black. So it was much easier to then uh, searching after a library, get introduced myself, how it works, because uh, image generating libraries are complicated every time. I don't know why, <laughs> but there is no. <laughs> Okay, the PNG library is okay, <laughs> but 
for example, if you want to use Lib JPEG, it's horrible. Or <laughs> well, you don't use it. It's a super low level library. <laughs> yeah, because I use PNG Writer and PNG Writer is using Lib JPEG on there. Yeah, but this is a really nice workaround. Yeah, in this case. It restricts you to the Jupyter Notebook. Like I couldn't compile this on my desktop now. No. No, yes, it's rest it's restricted to the kernel. It's also a small problem. Um, mm -hmm. I use the Swiss clean kernel, but there's also an official kernel from the root team, which you can also use. For example, if I create a new notebook, you see my list of notebooks, and these are the clean kernel, and this is the Swiss clean kernel. And the, but depending on the kernel, I have different features. Okay. So, the clean features are every time the same, but like uh, everything that has to do with output and input in the notebook is depending on the kernel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if we need the conclusion because we talked a lot of yeah. <laughs> about every feature. Yeah, maybe it's just an ask for the feature of the notebooks. Okay, I also explained everything. So you have the nice I.O. A remote access on systems via link. Uh, you can save the whole notebook, for example, um, as PDF. Save all. Oh no, don't know what was export. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if a question. Write down and Yeah. Why not? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is I have no. Um, tools to generate a PDF at the moment. Yeah, but in general, you can save it and you get to uh, save like this with um, with the pictures and as and so on. Uh, often I saw it for analysis of data. The uh, a physicist sent a notebook with the code and some plots mm -hmm. together. And they say, here, your data, this is the result. And you can uh, redo it. Redo it. Theoretically, because there's some code and yes. <laughs> yeah, but you can simply open the PDF. You don't need the kernel or anything else. This is also okay. really nice. I also use it uh, for proposals for, uh, for conferences. Mm -hmm. I generate PDF code and add it at the end of the presentation. Hey, arrows. Oh, yeah. It was just the PDF. Okay, uh, back to the presentation. Uh, yeah, okay, I think the point is I can uh, accelerate a little bit. So I already said that we have the Kling, that's the Tomlin application, and the Kling used the Kling AVM library. So the same like the C compiler. And it has the advantages if we update the base, we have new C features. At the moment, it's, there's an update to Kling 9 work in progress, so the Kling will get new C++ 20 features. This is the terminal application, and Kling itself is, is the input system, the interactive, as some source code manipulation, because we get in some kind of invalid C++ code, and the output is, um, is valid C++ code, otherwise the Kling cannot handle it. This is the output. So I believe the Kling has about 5,000 lines of code, so it's small. And it's developed by the CERN. The Kling LVM by the LVM. Um, LVM community. And then everything is yeah, integrated in the Swiss Kling kernel that is available in Jupyter Notebook. Um, there's also a second kernel for Kling provided by the CERN, and this is a Python script with simply use. Uh, Use the exec command to call clean and redirect input and output. This is the other approach how you can use and implement the kernel. The disadvantage of this is integrating features is more complicated. One advantage is printf works much better. Yeah, I had as this is also a crazy problem. Also a crazy problem. Printf in um, printf in libraries. The problem was printf prints to the standard out and the standard out is uh, the terminal. And the problem is I want to get the print out, uh, printf, to the notebook, so I have to redirect it. And the problem is there is no uh, standardized functionality to re redirect printf. 
the GNU library has some possibilities. And in, in uh, Windows, it was really complicated because since Visual Studio 2015, it's inlined the implementation and replacing was a huge problem. And the guys from Pondstack solved it, and I'm not sure how they solved it, but now it works. And it was a really big problem because a lot of libraries use printf internally. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then we have Drew Notebook, and I already showed you the website, and you see there are lots of different projects. Um, I use Jupyter Lab, which is already an uh, extension, so you can handle different notebooks on the site, and it has some extra features, and there's a lot of work and community in it. That's really nice. Who is Quantstack? Is it a company? Is it a community? Uh, Quantstack is a group, a French group. They have also office here in Berlin. And they are as financed by Bloomberg. Oh, Bloomberg? Yeah, Bloomberg. But <laughs> the software is open source. You can um, go to the GitHub repository, uh, start issues, and they have also a Jitter. And I already met the people, and it's really nice. Okay. And I was a little bit worried that uh, they was financed by Bloomberg. Yeah, and Bloomberg, I believe they also use Jupyter Notebooks for financial stuff. Yeah, probably. Makes yeah. sense. Make, makes sense, yeah. yeah. Quick question here. Um, because now that I really see, it uses LLVM in the background. So LLVM eventually has a backend to generate machine code. Yeah. Will it generate machine code with Kling as a front end, like what does it generate in the end? Oh, yes. So if you want to explain it, okay. Uh, this is the classic compiler. And uh, the compiler is a three phase design. Here we miss the middle phase. Normally it's an optimizer. And each, each phase is communicating with intermediate representation. So it means Kling takes C and uh, translate it to a standardized intermediate representation. At LVM, it's LVM ER. Looks like a kind of high high level assembler. This is optimized, and then the backend the LVM translated to the actual uh, platform. For example, x86 of my laptop, or to R ARM, or something else. The advantage is you, uh, you have the uh, you have the multiplication of different languages with different platforms, and you don't need to implement each combination. And you can also share optimization. So, so now the question is, if you run this in a Jupyter Notebook in a web browser, yeah. what is the code coming out of LLVM in the backend? x86 code. And where does it run? It runs... Um, it doesn't run in your web browser. It runs on the target system. So Jupyter so, yeah. has a kernel that's run on the server yeah. side. Yeah, that's really important. Ah, so okay. this, uh, this point is a JSON API. So it means this runs on my laptop in the web browser. And I know I exactly this on the server then. Yeah, and this ah. is on the server. So if I execute here a, cell, a JSON object is bundled and send it to the server, the server does something and print, uh, send back the result as JSON. Uh, JSON result. So if I close my web browser, the, con the server is simply running again. Uh, okay, continuous. Right, right. Yeah. This is also the reason why you can simply ex uh, provide access to a remote system. So this kernel is, for example, running on the HPC system without uh, a display, and the display is running on your notebook, and you communicate via JSON API. By the stupid API, then. Yes. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. So this okay. means it's also highly scalable to a large-scale system while yes. traffic to the notebook is still managed. Yes. So if you don't want uh, to send a really huge HTML um, stuff to your web browser, for example, uh, 8K video, mm. it's... Well, that's, there are other solutions. Yeah. That anyway. yeah, but then it's simply limited by the bandwidth. But yeah. in general, if you send simply small pictures, maybe a megabyte or something else, so it's comparatively fast. And how many Jupyter notebooks can I connect? That's infinite, basically. Can yes, I, it's. Can infinite. I have two Jupyter notebooks on the same Zeus Kling working on the same code at the same mm, time and the same data? I believe you. I'm not sure if you can uh, work on the same time in a notebook. 
like uh, Google Docs or something mm. else. Cooperative. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I forgot about. I'm not sure if this is possible. There's, but, there's a solution for that called Sage. Okay. Which that's is fine. basically so you can take a Jupyter notebook and it's even versionable. So that's yeah. that's the Sage project. Yeah. But really important is this notebook and this are different notebooks, so they have its own memory state. They are not linked together. This is also an other idea which we're working on it with Adios to create a generic API where we can connect processes which each other is which is necessary if you want to work in different notebooks. Yeah. Okay. I did not get this. Okay, we talked one and a half hour about the work which was done by other guys. <laughs> okay, so ah, I'm sorry. Then then you still have 22 minutes to talk about your own stuff. Oh yeah, that's really important. So okay, what I have done, um, I extended the Kling front end that it um, understand the CUDA C++ syntax because CUDA C++ syntax is not uh, valid C++ syntax. For example, you have this ugly brackets um, for a kernel launch. Wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. Triple angle brackets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you have some other semantic stuff, also some really ugly stuff because CUDA's... Yeah, the CUDA is ugly. Yeah, the CUDA, the CUDA AP. AP is probably watching. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the CUDA API is an API, but at one point it knows references. Yeah, this is really hard. So I have to tell Kling how to handle the syntax. Uh, luckily, um, it was done. Uh, luckily, there was a CUDA extension for the Clang. So my general work was to enable it and do a little bit on the meta parser. The meta parser is responsible to uh, detect the invalid C++ code and say what it's doing. For example, um, it used this a function called the global space and wrapped up is in a function that it's is valid C++ and I did some work that it also worked with uh, CUDA statements. Yeah, and the second thing which I was doing was add a second compiler pipeline because the Kling itself produced code for your target system, in my case x86 code, but if you um, execute a CUDA application, you need code for the device side for the GPU. And for everybody who don't know how a CUDA application works, you start a normal application on your CPU, and in the uh, application is the code embedded for the GPU and some instructions, which are done via function call, and the uh, application on your host say your GPU, here is your code, here is your data, do something it, and then they give me back the results, and I do something with this. And for this, I need two target architectures, one is the host CPU, and the other is the device. And NVIDIA use MVPDX code, it's a kind of assembler. And what we're doing is if we input the code, the front end has to decide if it's for host or device, and if it is for device, um, translate the code to NVPDX and embed it is in the host code, so the host code can send it to the GPU. In the end, it's just a string of bytecode which is sent to the GPU. And this was my work. It's a little bit shorter because I was not sure if should be if this should be a technical talk or to introduce introduction. Yeah, and I planned a half hour. <laughs> okay, and the nice side effect of this approach is if you start the Kling and execute your first line of CUDA code, the Kling itself becomes a CUDA application. So you can uh, use, for example, the MV prof or MV site the profiler to profile your Kling application and show what is happened. This is really nice. Okay, now it's time for the second demo. The second demo I already mentioned it is Game of Life. And the presentation should show how we want to couple a simulation, in our case later pick on GPU, with, a, with different analysis, which is at the moment doing by uh, pick on GPU, uh, not pick Isaac, but it's strongly coupled. Yeah, and for the presentation, I use the game of life because it's running locally 
And normally we need the HP system for a good <laughs> simulation. So. Yeah. so maybe to make this a bit clearer, he uses the full software or most of the software stack that we use as the back end to our really exascale yeah. simulations. So a game of life is one of those that takes most of these, these things and, and shows you exactly what the boat is doing, which makes it so very nice. Yeah. And the other advantages of game of life is it's easy to understand and visualize. And so uh, do, does anybody don't know what is game of life? Okay. Uh, game of life is really easy. You have Aren't your you a computer science student. No. I have to talk to Evo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have a world of, uh, of cells, and each cell has a state, dead or alive, and you iterate, you have different iterations, and every iteration you decide for each cell, if the cell keeps dead or alive, or becomes the other. And this depends on the own state and the state of the neighbors, and the rules are defined for different games. I don't know which rules I use at the moment, but it's really classic. So, so the, this comes again from the 70s, you could have guessed. Yeah. And was, uh, it's, it's basically a, a state machine, 2D state machine. And, and the idea was to, to create order from simple rules create complex behavior from simple rules. And one of the nice things is that you can create shapes with this thing that really, for example, move over the area that you're defining and that stay constant. There's actually mathematics behind that. For example, there are, there are little things that are called surfers and stuff like that that move in a certain direction. And the overall shape stays. And the shape is rather complex. So they, I think they even have names. Uh, like I used glider. Okay, you <laughs> used glider. So, so, so these these really move, and they're just because of this. They because of these very simple rules, you create a complex shape that has a certain behavior. So that's really that's really cool and nice. Yeah. Okay. That's why it's that's why it's actually called game of life because yeah. the idea was to create little binary organisms or something. And then these rules they decide whether it's whether you switch from yeah, back to yeah, you can we see it in a minute. So they just I, on a local basis, just yeah. uh, the adjustment I, I see. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, just uh, le uh, last general uh, information about the notebook. The first part is about the executing, the defining and executing the simulation. And the second part is analyzing the, um, the simulation. And in the simulation part, I generate some pictures, but it's just for visualization. In the normal case, you don't want to generate a picture for each simulation. Simeon, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting again, because one thing is very important. One of the things that, for example, also, this, there's, a, there's a strong, strong link for the computer scientist. There's a strong link between this work um, and, and 2D Turing machines as well. So if you you can have usually have a Turing machine and a one D where you where you basically work on an infinite infinite tape, but you can have finite two D Turing machines, and there has been active work. For example, if if you ever uh, had a look at compute complexity or something, uh, you might have heard of the busy beaver function. Which is no, no busy beaver. Busy beaver. Oh, busy beaver. Look it up. It's uh, with busy, with busy beaver. You can basically, if you if you ever have a child and they ask what's the largest number, say something busy beaver, <laughs> because that's for sure the largest number you can think of. It it, it breaks all the bounds of set set theory. Actually, it's a, it's an interesting number that. I, actually, for example, goes in the direction, if you can say that Busy Beaver 768, if you can give me the number from Busy Beaver six, 768, I can prove uh, five millennium puzzles at once. So there's a real interesting connection between all this. And, and one of the areas of this is two-day Turing machines, which go back to, to Conway's game of life. Okay, yeah, back 
course. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm hungry, so we have just a few minutes left. <laughs> okay. I, I go. <laughs> no, no, sorry. But you have to accelerate a little yeah. bit. Okay. Yeah, I prepared uh, the simulation with some standard libraries, some helper function for this thing. I include the PNG writer library, which simply generates a picture from my data. In this case, I use the unmodified version, which I download from GitHub. So it's the same version on GitHub. Right. And I define some helper function in header files. Yeah. Now I can set up the game of life, use a word with 10, uh, the size 10 uh, cross 10. And the first time we iterate over five iterations, and then I allocate some memory on the host, on the GPUs, and I read an initial word from a file, copy it on the GPU, and create a picture of the initial word. This was my preparation. Now I can define the QDA kernels. The first one is not so important, it's just a helper kernel. The second one is really important. And here you can see how it works. The first, what you do is calculating the ID of the own self. Then you watch at your neighbors and uh, save the number of living neighbors. And now you have the rules from, of the game of life. And here you can see the own state. In this case, it's living. And if I have uh, not more than one living neighbor, I become dead. And so on and so on. So that's really depending on the game. OK, now we have our main loop. The main loop simply to um, run the, um, the kernels, do a little memory swap because we used old world as input and write it to a new world and generate a picture at the end. So for the demo, oh, forgot to define the execute kernel. Okay, yeah, in the normal simulation, you will do, do not this at each. Um, step because you have to copy data from the GPU to the CPU and yeah, we have the boundary here. Maybe each 100 picture or something else that you um, have uh, intermediate result. Now I can display it. And we see the nice animation. Okay, so far so good. It's a classic uh, simulation. And now um, it's the first time we get some information about the simulation, and I know this is the figure glider, and glider has the property that is has the same shade every four iterations, just on the other position. So it means if we do four x uh, three extra uh, iteration, it become it gets the same state at the start. So this is a really interesting point. So the idea is now we have to iterate to state five uh, to state eight, and here we can use the property of persistence memory, because we don't need to calculate each iteration. We need just three iterations, because on the GPU, at the moment, there is the simulation at state five. So we simply say, do three iterations again, no memory copy or something else. And we see it continues, and it's the shape uh, which uh, like at the startup. And this, a simple demonstration. It's, uh, it looks not really famous, but imagine yourself you have a really huge uh, simulation and you need minutes for about 1,000 iterations. You can think about maybe in 1,000 steps something can happen, then you iterate 1,000, look at your simulation for a moment and think, okay, there's nothing, then 1,000 extra, and then say, hey, here's something interesting happens. I reduce the size, the step size to 100, and then to 10 and to one. So you can uh, slow down and uh, start again, uh, speed up your application. And also if you implement uh, a snapshot system on the system, you can restore the result in your notebooks. It's also an idea from us with uh, burst memory on uh, our system. But you don't need to run the whole simulation and waiting for the result in the end and look if it was correct. You can intercept it. Okay, this is the advantage of the simulation. And now we want to analyze the pictures. So for this, I use, I write a own CUDA kernel online. I could also load some analysis from a shard library or something. But in this case, I wrote a kernel. This 
color is really easy because it simply counts the living neighbors of a cell. So it looks really, uh, it's a part of the simulation color simply because counting neighbors. Now I allocate some extra memory on the uh, GPU because I want to use the simulation state um, as input and write it to the extra analysis uh, memory that I can continue later the simulation without some manipulations by the analysis. Yeah. And in this case, again, we have no memory copy. Simply allocate memory, do the analysis, it writes to the new space on the GPU, and now we can copy back the analysis to the uh, host CPU and display it. On a real-world simulation, you have just maybe some small screenshots from your simulation state, but you never copy the whole simulation data to your host system. You keep everything on the GPU, and so you avoid really big bottlenecks. Yeah. And here, you can see in the center, we have a cell, which has five living neighbors. And now there's an interesting question. If we continue with one uh, step, if there is a uh, state, yeah. if you have still a cell with five living neighbors, or maybe just with four, or maybe with six, so this is maybe an interesting question for us. So you simply execute one step, run the analysis again, and see, now we have two cells with four living cells. We can also add the other analysis, maybe some distance function also on the time, on this state. This is really great. Yeah. And now it's, um, the idea of this workflow is not completely new. There are also some plug-in system for certain application, uh, for certain simulation. But the problem is you have to define the plug-in system before you have to implement it for each application. And at this moment, it was the easier idea to develop a C++ interpreter because the interpreter is completely um, different approaches. Okay, yeah. What is the common development state? So all features which I showed you in the notebook before works also with the computer mode except two things. One is redefinition uh, because colors are not like C++ functions, so it needs the extra implementation that it works, and I will do it in the future. And the interaction with web elements is also a problem. So at the moment, just basic stuff like printing pictures works, buttons and so not. The reason are some bugs in the device compiler. It's just bugs and it needs an update of the King LVM base to fix it. And the CUDA runtime support is also restricted. Some features in CUDA are not supported in the moment. For example, constant device memory or global device memory. And the problem is really simple because it's a hack from NVIDIA. It has nothing to do with standard C++, and so it needs some extra implementation. And we have to extend it to the Kling that the Kling can handle it because at the moment Kling understands poor the behavior of C++ and some parts of CUDA, but it has also to understand the special behavior of the full, full CUDA. And the other problem is um, the CUDA support based on the LVM version at the moment. We have a really old version, version 5, so just CUDA 8 is supported. With the upgrade to CUDA 9, uh, to Clang 9, which is hopefully done this or next month, we get support for CUDA 10.1 and new features. Okay, and the last pos position is Alpaca. Alpaca is our C header only library providing performance portability layers. So it means um, we simply we implement our algorithm, execute this, and depending on the template parameter which defines accelerator, it would be executed on the CPU or GPU. In practice, it's a little bit more complicated, but the idea is write our algorithm in one time and execute it on different systems. And we have some ideas. For example, we uh, already mentioned is uh, testing and performance measuring. So you uh, uh, can define your kernel with Alpaca and then simply by changing the template parameter, you can 
test it if it performs better on a CPU or GPU. And that's faster than compiling the whole kernel each time. You can also decide it for each kernel in the application. Yeah. Also, is template optimization and runtime for Pico GPU, because what we're doing at the moment in Pico GPU is we have a lot of templates that the compiler can optimize it, but uh, it optimizes on problem size. And what we do is we have a generator which generates a lot of kernels for different problem size. And this increased the compile time really, really large, about seven and a half minutes for, for each compilation because we can also not store templates. And the other problem is we have a problem if we have a problem size which was not, uh, which we don't recognize before. And with Kling, we can simply say on runtime, we have this problem size, optimize your code for this, and then execute it. Yeah. Yeah, and hence profiling and debugging at runtime. You already saw it with the memory pointers and maybe the interface and reflection and so on. Okay. Yeah, last point. No, no real summary. It's better because you can try it by yourself. I prepared the singularity container for everybody who don't know singularity. It's like Docker. If you don't know Docker, read Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, Docker is like a virtual machine. Uh, yeah, not exactly the same as the lightweight version. Yeah, but the advantage is you can ship your whole environment and container. And I did it. I put a whole software stack because it's a little bit complicated in the container. And what do you need on your system is simply you need a Linux computer with a NVIDIA driver and a graphic card, Singularity, and a web browser. So the requirements are really slow for so complicated software step. And then you can simply run this command, and the command will download the container from a registry, execute it, and start a Drupal.lab uh, instance. And then you can open the link on your web browser and, every, and try it. You can do the same uh, thing which I did. Yes. Okay. And I believe this is all. Yeah, some sources. This is uh, the technical stuff if you're interested in. This is a more detailed implementation. Okay. And um, you can watch also the GDC presentation, which is a little bit extended on other points. And everything is uploaded to Sinodo. So you can also download my example libraries uh, for the for the game of life example. You need to compile uh, the PNG library and copy it in folder of the simulation, but yes, you can use it. Okay, thanks. Thank you.